I remind you where we were last, uh, at, the, at the end of the last talk. So we, we had the reflections. So we had these generators, which had delta squared equal to minus 2. Delta belonged to the neuron severity group of x, which was h11 of the surface intersected with the integer lattice. So the, it was this group. Uh, one thing I forgot to say, and that's important, is that whenever you have a, so, so the reason why this group is relevant is that if, so as an aside, if you have C inside X, a compact curve, meaning a compact Riemann surface, then the fundamental class of C belongs to the neuron severity group, meaning that it lies both inside the integer, oops, the integer lattice, because it's a, a, it, the class of a manifold, but it also lies inside this H11 subspace. So this is why having large neuron severity group is the same as you might hope that in that case you have a lot of uh, submanifolds inside your uh, K3 surface. So uh, we're interested. We are particularly interested in these. The classes which had square minus two, which responded essentially to P1s, to uh, rational lines in the, in, on the K3 surface. And we had, so this was uh, uh, the picture of H19. And if we had a delta outside here, it determined a hyperplane. Uh, there's no need to have notation for it because we're not going to need a notation. But uh, as you took the union over all such possible hyperplanes, you, know, you, you get some picture that looks like this. And I, I said that the, the one important fact was that we had that the Kähler cone of x is a chamber, uh, and by chamber I mean the following. For each delta, you draw one of the hyperplanes, and it separates the hyperbolic space into two uh, different pieces. And you do this for all the possible deltas, and you'll have a bunch of disconnected chambers. And uh, in fact, they'll all be isometric because this uh, reflection group we had a group Wx acting on this whole thing and it was generated by the reflections at, as delta. And the group, this reflection group acts transitively on these chambers. In fact, this picture is probably not very accurate in the sense that all these chambers are supposed to be isometric. And uh, the Kähler cone picks out one of these chambers. Uh, Uh, so what, what, what is the Kähler cone? I promise that I will uh, say a few words about Kähler geometry. So uh, let me recall that if you have x, so for, for the purposes of this discussion, uh, any n-dimensional manifold is OK. So if x is a compact, well, it doesn't have to be compact, it's a complex n-dimensional, so a Kähler form. Omega is a closed, which just a reminder means d omega is equal to zero, form, sorry, two form, such that if you define g using uh, omega of i. So this is an anti skew-symmetric form, and you use the complex structure. Uh, I, you obtain a symmetric form such that this is a Riemannian metric. So this is the definition of the associated Riemannian metric. And I, as I said, so I goes from the tangent space to the tangent space. And when you do it once, it gives you minus the identity. So this is the complex, the operator of complex structure. 
So uh, typically, so locally, when you have holomorphic coordinates, you would write that omega is something of the form uh, gi j bar dzi with dz dz j bar. So you have such coordinates, and you also have the important condition that d omega is equal to zero. And the Kähler cone in this case is so d omega is equal to zero. And this implies that the class of omega belongs to H2 of x. Uh, so it gives you a cohomology class. And the Kähler cone is, is the, uh, all, all the cohomology classes which can be represented by a Kähler form. OK, so, uh, th so the content of the theorem is that any class, so there's a chamber here, let's say this one, that such that any uh, class in here can be represented by uh, a Kähler form. So let me also remark that, uh, uh, so what this hyperplane does, it, it determines vectors on one side pair positively with delta, and vectors on the other side pair negatively with delta. And uh, a Kähler form must have this property that integrated over any compact Riemann surface inside, uh, it has to integrate positively. So this is how such a chamber is determined. So uh, there's another very special feature about K3 surfaces, uh, w which is, uh, the fact that they have uh, some very special uh, Kähler metrics. So I, I, I want to explain this. And so suppose that you have a complex n-manifold and it has this Kähler metric. So you can ask about its curvature. So let me recall that Kx is uh, essentially the top exterior power of the complex tangent space. This is the canonical bundle. Uh, and it's also so it's holomorphic. And if you have, um, so if omega is a Kähler metric on X, then uh, if you take it, its nth power, uh, gives a, it also gives a metric on Kx. And so now you can compute the curvature of this line bundle. And it turns out that uh, the following is true. So if you define, uh, so I don't want to say it. Yeah, so, so the Ricci curvature of the metric determined by omega is going to be equal to uh, the curvature of kx with a uh, metric omega to the n. So again, if you, if you want to write this out in coordinates, what you'll get is, so if omega is of that shape, then uh, you'll get that, so you'll have rho is equal to root minus one dd bar of log of the determinant of g i j bar. So you take this uh, n by n matrix, you take its determinant, it's some function, and you take its, well, it's going to be a positive, uh, a, a real number, and you take log and you take the Laplacian of it, and this is going to be the curvature. And so you notice that, uh, this is, again, locally, and you notice that omega and rho can be compared, and so you say that you have a Kähler Einstein metric if, if uh, omega is equal to k times rho, where k is some real number. Bless you. So uh, this is when you, you say you have a Kähler Einstein metric. Oops. Uh, 
Where's the eraser? So this is. OK. Just one sec. Actually, I'll just use the. So let me just remind you again to compare with the case of Riemann surfaces. So again, there, there are three possibilities. So when you have k is equal to plus 1, uh, what kind of Riemann surface can you get? The, the only one that works is you have uh, c hat. When k is equal to 0, you get uh, elliptic curves. And when k is equal to minus 1, you get uh, higher genus. And uh, you can ask the same kind of thing about the uh, K3 surface, or any uh, complex surface. And it's important to, uh, to remark the following, that the cohomology class of uh, our surface, so of uh, rho, uh, is constrained. So it cannot be anything now. It's an H2. The words rho is equal to 2 pi times the first churn class of the tangent bundle of x. So it's really predetermined by the topology of the manifold. And in particular, yeah, it, uh, it cannot be anything. So it implies that if you're looking for a metric uh, which satisfies that equation with k uh, of, of you know, some, some choice of k, that's the sign of k and the uh, choice of omega is essentially predetermined. And so it turns out that if you have general, so when uh, you have that rho, the class of rho is scalar, or let me say this, when 2 pi c1 of x is scalar, uh, then uh, there exists Essentially, essentially unique, uh, sorry, yeah, I, th I think I want to say that this, no, minus, so the sign is very important. So when you have negative curvature, then there exists a unique uh, Kähler Einstein metric. And this corresponds to the unique metric of negative curvature on the Riemann surface, but you have this on typical surfaces of general type. But when uh, x is k3, then uh, you, you can only the only thing you can take there is k equals to, uh, zero. Uh, you know, I think the k should have been on the other side. This is almost equivalent, except for when it's not zero. Uh, when it, when it's zero, so because you, you see the problem, right? It's it's too high to change now, but. In, in your notes, you should move the k to the other side. Yes? Uh, so can you repeat again how um, a Kähler form determines a point in that H19? Uh, so a Kähler form uh, determines a ray, uh, right? So if you have a Kähler form, uh, well, it determines a point in, so let me just do it here. So the class of omega belongs to H11 which has signature 119. So again, if you, if you draw this picture, you know, the killer form is, you know, if you projectivize, you get that picture. And so a killer form determines a point in that space. OK, so I'm, uh, we're all interested in killer forms up to scaling. Yeah, so it will automatically satisfy that if you take it squared, it's po it's po it has a positive. Yeah. Uh, so when x is a k3, so k is equal to 0. And then it's not true that omega is equal to 0, but rather that rho is equal to 0. So uh, it turns out that in this case, you want to solve an equation of the following type. Ah, so maybe I should say that who, who is this due to? So this, in this case, when the sign is negative 1, this is due to Aban and Yao. Well, independently. And in some sense, this corresponds to the easy case of the uniformization theorem. 
so the intermediate case is when uh, you have zero curvature, and this was uh, done by Yao. And when you have positive curvature, the situation is a lot more complicated because uh, you have, you know, even on the Riemann sphere, you have a huge group of symmetries, which really makes the metric not entirely canonical. So uh, th there's been a lot of work recently. But I just want to uh, tell you about the case of K3 surfaces. And so uh, it turns out that what you have to do is you need to solve uh, the following uh, mont Ampere equation. So uh, to solve uh, so, uh, l l let me just state the theorem and in the most general form, this is due to Yao. So it says the following, that uh, for any uh, f, which is smooth, on x, uh, and any Taylor metric omega, there exists a phi uh, in the infinity of x such that two things happen, such that omega plus i d d bar phi to the n is equal to e to the f times omega to the n. And this is, I'm going to call it omega phi. I'm going to, so I'm going to use an abbreviation. So this is Kähler. So you have a Kähler metric in this class. And you need a condition, and the condition is that provided the integrals on both sides agree, uh, the integral of e to the f omega to the n is equal to the integral of over x of omega plus, well, in fact, you don't need to do d d bar because omega and omega phi are cohomologous, so they have the same volume. So you're not changing the volume. So provided you fix the volume normalization, you can solve an equation of this type. And, uh, and this is true, in fact, for any, on a, any compact Kähler manifold. What is, how, how is it relevant to K3 surfaces? So for K3s, uh, so l l let's look a little bit on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, you have essentially a volume form, which you can prescribe. Uh, in any way you like in advance. And so for K3s, uh, you have, uh, so given a Kähler metric omega, uh, there exists f such that uh, omega squared is equal to e to the f omega wedge omega bar. No, let me write it this way, e to the f omega squared equals omega wedge omega bar, where omega is the holomorphic n form, uh, two forms. So we can fix the volume. Uh, so you have a canonical volume form, and given any Kähler metric, there's a relation to this, uh, uh, to this canonical volume form given by this uh, scaling factor. And the solution to, so the metric omega phi solving uh, omega phi squared is equal to omega wedge omega bar uh, will be a Ricci flat metric. Bless you. So, What it implies is that if, if you can, so in, in local coordinates, you're solving an equation which says that uh, dd bar of log of the determinant of a matrix is equal to uh, a constant. And it implies, in fact, because you're solving this globally, it implies that, in fact, uh, the determinant of that matrix is constant. So, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize is that in order to construct Ricci flat metrics on K3 surfaces, you need to solve an equation of this type. And uh, you know, if, if you write it in local coordinates, it's saying that the, de the, de the determinant of some 
matrix of derivatives is equal to some other prescribed matrix. And I want to show you a, a sort of heuristic for how, uh, for, for why at least that, such proof exists and for why, why such metrics exist. So are there any questions at least so far about what we're doing? OK. So th the reason why uh, I want to explain the proof is because it actually brings in a nice space. So actually, I, I feel like there's not a lot of enthusiasm for showing, the, for seeing the proof of uh, like how to solve this nonlinear equation. So, uh, would you guys prefer? Maybe I'll do something. Uh, maybe I'll skip this proof for now. Is that is that? <laughs> no, no. I I, I can say I, there's. So I want to eventually get to dynamics and. The problem is that if I will not have enough time to say everything that I want to say in this lecture, then we'll run out of uh, time. So maybe uh, as a compromise, I'll, I'll try to explain um, uh, what is the moduli space or the analog of technical space for K3 surfaces. And if there's any remaining time at the end of this lecture, I'll explain how to solve that equation. OK? Because uh, I, I think the sort of Teichmuller space point of view will be more, uh, more important. So uh, in, in the K3 surfaces literature, so this is called the subject of Torelli theorems. And they refer to the following. So uh, what you want to do is you want to reconstruct the K3 surface, which is this nonlinear object from uh, this linear algebraic data of this Hodge decomposition and the lattice, the integral structure. So uh, in order to do this, so I will make a nota notation and definition. So definition. So I'll denote by lambda the K3 lattice, which up to isomorphism is this unique uh, signature 319 um, so I it's isomorphic to H2 of xz plus cup product. Uh, and so we're going to say that a marked K3 surface uh, or a marking maybe is the data of an isomorphism uh, oops, iota from lambda into h2 of x, z. And so the, a marking is just remember giving a name to each cohomology class according to some once and for all fixed standard uh, lattice. And this is essentially like uh, what you would do for a Riemann surface is except that you're not remembering the full topology, but just the middle cohomology. So this, it turns out that it's enough to throw out the rest of the information for most of what we want to do. So uh, then l let me denote by m lambda uh, the space of all, of all marked K3s. Uh, up to uh, isomorphisms that respect the marking. Sorry? Uh, okay, but. Uh, yeah, so this is like the Teichmuller space. Uh, this is like the Teichmuller space, but. Um, no, th 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 there's in fact a good reason for this notation. Uh, but uh, it, it's it's all but uh, I, I can in fact say what what the point is. In fact, uh, the reason why this is called I guess M lambda is because you can make in fact you can forget 
some part of lambda. So you can take a smaller piece of lambda, and then there will be associated uh, spaces, which will in fact behave more like the moduli space than the Teichmuller space. So let me uh, also make the following definition. So this is one, one guy, and then the other actor is D is going to be the set of alpha in the projectivization of the compl complication of this. So you have the lattice, you extend scalars to the complex numbers, and you take the associated complex projective space. Uh, and you require two things, alpha times alpha is equal to 0, and alpha times alpha bar is bigger than 0. So given uh, alpha, uh, we have a decomposition. So let me call it, let me put brackets, because we only care about the line, not about the vector itself. OK? So given an alpha, we have a decomposition uh, of the complexification as uh, alpha plus something in the middle plus alpha bar. And in the middle, you just take alpha plus alpha bar orthogonal complement. So you should think of this as morally as h to 0, this is h0,2, and this is h1,1. OK? Uh, so, so this is what uh, d is. And maybe just for completeness, let me just remark the following. So let me denote by g uh, the orthogonal group. the orthogonal group associated to the real lattice. So this is uh, isomorphic to essentially O319R. And not by gamma, the orthogonal group of the integer lattice. Uh, so it turns out that G, the real uh, group, acts transitively on D. And uh, what is the stabilizer? So G acts transitively on D. And uh, in fact, D is isomorphic to, uh, let me write it like this, O319 of our modulo O2 cross O119. Always real groups. So. Uh, wh what I want to emphasize is that w the stabilizer of a line like this is not a compact subgroup. OK, so O1, 19 is a non-compact subgroup of this Lie group. And as a consequence, so, G, so gamma acts on D, uh, but not uh, properly discontinuously. Word, in, in other words, for most points in D, uh, the orbit under gamma is dense. There, not for every point, but for, for most points, the, the orbit is dense. And let me also remark that uh, gamma, uh, so this group gamma acts also on m lambda uh, by, change, by changing base, by reparameterization. So now I can tell you what the Torelli theorem says. And the Torelli theorem relates these two spaces, D and the space of marked K3s. But it, it turns out that they're not quite isomorphic, but rather uh, they're Almost, well, the problem is that it turns out this m lambda is not even a Hausdorff space. So uh, it, it's a little bit of a strange gadget, but in fact, it contains a lot of the geometry of, uh, of K3 surfaces. So the theorem and the problem with the, 
I guess the theorem has been proven in different levels of strength by different people. So I'll just give you some of the names. So maybe the first were Petetsky, Shapiro, and Shafarevich. And then uh, Lehang and Peters. And uh, Burns, Rappaport. So the, the theorem is the following. Uh, well, the first part is, is just a general fact, and it's that uh, so M lambda has a natural complex structure. Uh, and the map uh, so this map from M lambda into D, uh, which assigns a marking. So if you have a marking here, iota, it sends it to iota inverse of H two zero of X. So remember, iota was a marking from lambda into H2 of x. And you could pull back a Hodge decomposition here to a Hodge decomposition here. And by the construction of D, that gives you a, a natural map like this. So this map is holomorphic. Uh, one thing that is uh, confusing is that, as I said, this m lambda is not Hausdorff. But what is true is that this map is uh, a covering map. So what does it mean? So perhaps you're familiar with the double line. So this is the real line where at the origin you have two points. And you have a chart that covers a chart near this point is like this. A chart near this point is on this half. And this is a manifold. It's just not Hausdorff. And this map, this guy maps to the real line. And it's a covering map, right? But yeah, but they're not the same. And this is roughly what's happening here. Yes? Uh, well, so it has this, uh, so, so to give a complex structure means to give certain charts to some complex space as the transition maps are holomorphic. So it turns out that, you see, this M lambda has a, uh, well, it parameterizes some complex manifolds. So there's a way to, there's some general theory which controls somehow the deformations of complex manifolds. And it puts on such, whenever you have such a space, you'll have some complex structure. And yeah? And the points where it fails to be Hausdorff, it's a small subset or some like in your picture? Yeah, so, so it, it's both small and big in the following sense. Uh, it's everywhere dense. But uh, for a generic point, uh, the map is one to one. So you, you should imagine that somehow you have this nice domain, and through it, you put a lot of skewers that keep adding these double lines. For, for some, at some point, you'll have uh, a lot of uh, such double points, in fact. So you kind of keep putting a lot of these guys, and they, you know, it's still a covering map, but it just has a lot of stuff above each point. Yeah? Is there a simple example to see the non Hausdorff? Yeah, so in fact, people uh, knew this uh, for a long time in, in a different form. So the, w w what is true is the following. L I'll give you the example in a moment. I just want to finish the statement. And the statement is that the other thing is that the map is also surjective, which again is uh, an important fact. It's saying that for any linear algebraic data that you can ever prescribe uh, that's a valid Hodge decomposition, there will be a K3 surface which realizes it. OK? Uh, so now uh, the example is called, it's what are called flops. And the situation is this. You can have, there exist two families. Uh, 
uh, let me say x and x prime uh, of k3s over the disk in a disk, which is z less than 1. So there exist two such families with the following slightly paradoxical property, such that uh, it, you know, if you restrict x to the punctured disk, uh, and x prime to the punctured disk, then they're in fact isomorphic. And uh, so in fact, there's an isomorphism that takes it like this, so that commutes with a projection to the disk. And the fiber over 0, so x0, is isomorphic to, to x0 prime. So these are the fibers over 0. Uh, but uh, x is not isomorphic to x prime, uh, going this way. So what it's saying is that you can map the disk. You see, imagine that this it wasn't the unit complex disk, but just the punctured real line. There are two ways to map the real line in such a way that uh, you know, if this parameterizes some natural objects, if you pull back these families, you get uh, things which are isomorphic objects, but not isomorphic families. Okay, so they're isomorphic in the complement, and they, it's just that at this particular value, they don't uh, agree. So wh why is this called a flop? So it turns out that in order to build such a thing, uh, so, so the reason for this non-surjectivity is exactly the minus two curves. So it turns out, so l let me just say the following. So x0 uh, contains a minus 2 curve. And w what you can do is, uh, in fact, it turns out that you can contract the minus 2 curve. You can make a singular space. But, but you contract it not just in the manifold itself, but in the ambient x. So you kind of contract it, and then you blow it back up in a slightly different way. Or no, is that what I want to say? No, no, I think you blow it up and then you contract in such a way that you have not changed the central fibers, you have not changed the manifold, but you have acted upon, like, you, you've changed, you know, there, there, like, there's no actual map between these th total spaces of the manifolds. So I guess what I want to say is that there's a guy that dominates, there's a common space that dominates these two things, but not, uh, but not in a way in which you know the fibers are K3 surface. No, sorry, I want to say that anyway. So the the the, the point is that the, the space is not uh, Hausdorff, and in fact, uh, you can think of the fibers above a point as uh, essentially naturally identified with the K3 uh, with the chambers that you had in this reflection group. So if you have a lot of chambers, then uh, all of these things give an ambiguity in the marking, essentially. And finally, to, to uh, get to dynamics, it turns out that this information about the Torelli theorem is enough to tell you about the automorphisms of the K3 surface. So. Uh, a theorem is the following, that if, so if you have x1 and x2, two k3 surfaces, so the first version is that if there exists uh, an isomorphism from h2 of x1 to h2 of x2, preserving uh, z and Hodge structure, then uh, x1 is isomorphic to x2. But I'm not claiming that the isomorphism which realizes the identification between x1 and x2 is compatible with the isomorphism that uh, you have here. And if you want to impose that as well, uh, so if additionally uh, so let me give this guy a name. We call it f. If additionally f 
preserves the killer cones. Uh, then there exists a unique f, an isomorphism from x1 to x2, uh, acting, well, I guess I'm going the other way, so from x2 to x1, such that the pullback and cohomology of capital F is equal to little f. OK, so it's saying that, uh, first of all, the Hodge structure determines the isomorphism class. But if you also know about the Kähler cone, then in fact, you can determine uh, the automorphism group as well. OK? So, so these are the, uh, the, the, these are the uh, basic facts about the, this sort of space of K3 surfaces. And now I want to just give you an example, which can be made relatively concrete, of an automorphism, or a K3 surface with, with uh, a rich automorphism group. I guess I should have asked, are there, are there questions about what I've said so far? No. No. OK. So the example is the following. So we're going to take the what are called uh, by uh, or degree two 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 surfaces in one plus one plus p one. So what this means is the following: that you write an equation of degree uh, at most two. So so let's say. So this is a typical example, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus a x y z plus 1 is equal to 0. So this lives inside uh, a fine 3 space, and it gives you a surface. And you can compactify it to infinity in many different ways when you have a3. And the best, I mean, for this discussion is to compactify by putting a projective space in each factor, projective line in each factor. And uh, so the way this looks like roughly is something like this. So you have some surface, lives in three space. And you can think of the product of P1s as, a bunch, uh, as holding it in a box. And uh, the point about this uh, choosing by degree 2 to 2, so the first thing is you have to check that this is a K3 surface. And you can do it using the residue construction. So you can ex write expl an explicit volume form on this uh, manifold. And now, uh, you see, if, so if you freeze uh, one of the two of the variables, so imagine that x is a variable, and you treat y and z as constants, then you get a quadratic equation, right? So if you have a quadratic equation, uh, it has two solutions. And you can exchange the two solutions. So if you look at this picture, if you map the surface to the plane, above each point, there are two other points on the surface. And you can exchange them. So there's an involution. So sigma x uh, acting on, y, on the y variable is just y. Sigma x of z is equal to z. And if you want to, it only changes the x coordinate of the point, which satisfies this equation, by taking it to the other root. So explicitly, it says that sigma x of x. So there are two ways to uh, find the root. You can use the constant term of the quadratic. And you know that the product of the, const of, the constant of the two roots is the constant term. So you could write it as y squared plus z squared plus 1 over x. And you can check that if you plug in this term instead of x everywhere, you can clear the denominators. And you'll get again that this is 0. Or you can also use a different expression. So you can use the degree 1 term. And you need to, uh, you know, this is minus the sum of the roots. So if you take minus a, y, z minus x, 
then again, uh, this will be, in fact, these are equal because if you multiply by x and bring things to the other side, you can see that this equation again is, status, uh, is zero, so these two terms are equal. So you get an evolution that looks like this. And similarly for, you have another evolution sigma y and another evolution sigma z. So uh, I should um, maybe say, uh, so the, the kind of automorphism we'll be interested in is by composing these three evolutions. So uh, let me try to uh, bring a little bit to, uh, together the concepts that we had earlier. So the, so for generic x, so for generic uh, parameters, you'll have that the neuron severity group of such a thing has rank three. So you get actually a genuine hyperbolic pla uh, plane and in fact, you have, uh, so I'll, I'll draw the usual hyperbolic plane like this. So in fact, uh, which one? Uh, this, yes. If you compactify it in P1 times P1 times P1. OK, uh, are there other questions? OK, so. Parameter is the a, yes. So if you set a to a fixed value, like 17, you'll get a surface. So this is a case three for every a? When it's not singular. So it could be singular sometimes. For some very finitely many values of a, this could be a singular surface. OK. So. Uh, there are at least three obvious curves on this K3 surface. So you can slice it by a plane that goes this way. So you can have a curve like this. And this is going to be, it turns out that this is going to be an elliptic curve. So, uh, and, uh, so uh, maybe let me ask the following. What is the self-intersection of this slice? So if you slice it, what, uh, you'll get a curve. What is the self-intersection number of this curve? Two. So what? Minus two. So wh 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 why do you think it would be minus two? I can't see. Well, that was the, the only self-intersection number we had uh, so far. But uh, you see, it's an elliptic curve. It's not P1. And uh, in fact, you can move it off itself by just moving the plane. right? So if you can move it off itself without intersection, the self-intersection number is zero. Very good. So this means that it will be on the boundary of the hyperbolic plane, right? So you'll have, uh, let me call these uh, such a curve. Let me call it e x comma y because it's determined by the. So if I, I would take the horizontal plane, it will be in, in the x y plane. So you'll have three such guys: e x y, e y z, and e z x. And typically, they will generate the neuron severity group for generic parameters. If the parameters are not generic, then you might have more such curves. And it turns out that, uh, so how will sigma x act? So sigma x will preserve two of these curves. And it will act, in fact, as a reflection. So sigma x is going to be a reflection in this line. And it's going to take e, y, z to sigma x of, e, yeah? So e x y is e x y is any of the homology classes that you get, or cohomology classes that you get by intersecting this surface with the x y plane. So z constant. Z constant. And what does it have to do with the sigma? Sigma x is an involution. Nothing. Well, n n oh, yeah. In fact, sigma x will preserve this. So. So if I cut it like this, with a plane, right, then right, so, well, sigma x will be an involution which will be going this way, right? And it will be a reflection in the other plane. 
So it will, in fact, sigma x will be the only involution which moves this particular curve. And why is the elliptic curve again? Uh, well, because if you do this one dimension lower, so if you take a degree 2, 2 curve in P1 times P1, you can check that there's going to be an elliptic curve. And this is what you're doing. You're intersecting it, and that's what comes out. OK, are there other examples, uh, other questions? So uh, w one thing that's, uh, 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 to avoid confusion, these involutions are very different from the sigma deltas, as deltas that we had. It's not the minus 2 curve. So this example typically has no minus 2 curves. So there's no, these involutions are very different from the previous involutions. And it turns out that this, these reflections, uh, so here you'll have sigma z, and here you'll have sigma y. And these reflections will generate a triangle reflection group that will look like this. And in fact, the Kähler cone is going to be the whole open cone in here. Okay, so there's no chamber. The Kähler cone is everything here. And uh, if you take, so let me take, copy down the numbers. Uh, okay, so, so there are two things. So we have this neuron severity group. It has rank 3. It turns out that the intersection matrix So we, had that e we said that each curve has self-intersection 0. But with the other curves, it intersects. And you'll have, uh, you have a quadratic form, which is like this. And it has signature 1, 3. Okay? Uh, and you have that the way sigma x acts, so sigma x is going to be the way it will change basis, as I said, it's not changing the first two curves, uh, sigma, uh, the, the one that have uh, an x in them, so xy and zx. But it, it acts using this transformation. It's a, it's a, you can check that this is an involution. So if you multiply this matrix uh, with itself, you, you will get the identity. And sigma y and sigma z are similar. And OK, and it turns out that if you multiply them, so in the order, the following order, sigma z, sigma y, sigma x, I'm going to get a matrix that looks like this, minus 1, minus 2, minus 6, 2, 3, 0. No, 10. And 2, 6, 15. So this is a 3 by 3 matrix. Uh, so what happens when you compose these three involutions? You'll get an isometry of the hyperbolic plane. What kind of isometry do you think you'll get? So maybe before asking what happens when you compose three involutions, what happens if you just compose sigma x and sigma y? What kind of isometry do you get? So you get a unipotent transformation that goes like this. Right? If you will compose three of them, you'll get a hyperbolic transformation. And so the, this matrix has eigenvalues. Uh, where are they? Minus 1, lambda, and lambda inverse, where lambda is 9 plus 4 root 5. Uh, so this is a hyperbolic transformation. So if you think about it geometrically, well, Describing the f is, is a little bit tricky, but what is uh, the composition of sigma x and sigma y? Essentially, sigma x and sigma y will preserve one of the, uh, one of the elliptic curves, right? One of the classes. And what it's going to do, so e, x, y, any of these horizontal slices like this. And what the composition will do is it will twist along each of the elliptic curves, but in a manner which varies as you vary the parameter going from top to bottom. And so it's kind of like a twist. So it's preserving this vibration. But then when you apply an involution, it takes them somewhere else. OK, so 
Uh, also, notice that each of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z has determinant minus 1. And so the product, the product has also determinant minus 1. But if you want, if you have your favorite, like, 2, 1, 1, 1 matrix, you would have to take, uh, you know, you, you'd have to take a product of four involutions. OK? So are there questions about this example? Or the fact that uh, you, you can see that you can obtain a lot more transformations uh, using, this, uh, using this discussion. All of the, yeah, so, so for a typical, uh, again, for generic values of the parameter, this is going to be the full automorphism group. Yeah. Are there other questions? Or? OK, so uh, I, I, I want to, um, not so going wrong, oh. yeah. So, so I want to say a few things about uh, wh wh what I'll try to do in the last lecture. So, so what's the group? Which group? Generated by these? Yes. It's a free product of two, three Z mod twos. So it, it acts faithfully on this picture. So uh, from now on, oh, so we'll take f from x to x. So it's homomorphic. Automorphism, and uh, so it preserves this decomposition H two zero plus H one one plus H zero two. Uh, so it preserves this decomposition. So this means that it acts on H one one, which has this hyperbolic signature. So we're always going to assume. Uh, the, there exists an eigenvalue uh, lambda bigger than 1 of absolute value bigger than 1. Uh, and in fact, it is unique. So if you have uh, su such, a, such an eigenvalue, because you see here the signature is 119, so there's at most one eigenvalue bigger than 1. And here, the, matrix, the inner product is positive definite, so the uh, eigenvalue has to be uh, on the unit circle. And so in this case, we'll say that we have this hyperbolic automorphism. And wh what will happen is that, so in this case, just uh, at the level of linear algebra, there exists unique. So maybe I should say that some of the things that I'll state now are due to Serge Cantat. So there exists unique uh, uh, eigendirections. So I'll, 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 usually, I, I'll think about the line, but I'll write an actual class. So let me call them eta plus and eta minus in uh, H11, such that f pullback of eta plus minus is equal to lambda plus minus of eta plus minus. And so this is just at the level of linear algebra. This is essentially the assumption I made there. But uh, one fact about them is that uh, there exists unique, unique uh, positive currents, positive closed currents, and and I, I'm using here currents in the sense that uh, Giovanni was using earlier in his talk. So meaning. Their distributions with so their differential forms with distributional coefficients, they're positive in a sense, which I'll make explicit uh, when we talk about them in more detail. So there exists a unique such positive closed currents, eta plus and eta minus, with uh, in in those cohomology classes. So 
such that if you pull back eta plus now at the level of ge geometrically, not just uh, uh, so not just at the level of cohomology, but at the level of currents, they obey this kind of equation. And finally. If you define the topological entropy of F, the topological entropy, uh, then this is equal to uh, log lambda. And so this is th this theorem is due to uh, Gromov and Yom. So it follows from two rather general theorems proved by Gromov and Yomden. So Yomden proved that the topological entropy is at least this number. And Gromov proved that this, the topological entropy is at most this number. And together, it implies that it is this number. So uh, at the beginning of the uh, next lecture, I will define what the topological entropy is and what it means uh, for a current to be positive and closed. And uh, I'll explain how these currents are constructed and how they're related to this notion of entropy. All right, thanks. <coughs>